So let's get started with some uh, thinking on the place of religion in a secular world. Uh, the name of this talk is, Why Do Human Beings Have Value? Because you decide they do. And with, uh, with this talk is Richard Grigg, Professor of Philosophy, Theology, and Religious Studies here at Sacred Heart University. It's valuable because various cultures have decided that it's valuable. And of course, those cultures even enhance the value by uh, associating it with particular contexts. I mean, giving someone a, a diamond necklace like this would be most likely, as we usually understand it, a romantic gesture, among other things, right? I mean, I, I wouldn't give this as a gift to my father, for instance, OK? So there again, value is conferred. Now, there may well be some things that are valuable just in and of themselves. Uh, a hammer is valuable for pounding nails and therefore valuable for building houses. Uh, and yet, somebody had to invent the hammer and decide that building houses was a, a valuable gesture. So even that's not entirely clear that we don't need some kind of uh, conferring of value. So what I'm thinking is that it would just be ideal if every one of us decided to confer value on every other human being on the planet. Right? If we all conferred value on the seven point whatever billion other people who are around here. Uh, and many of you here, and maybe me in my better days, might say, hey, but I already do that. I believe that all people are valuable. I've never doubted that. But I'm going to suggest that sometimes when you're down in the day-to-day -day world and uh, you know, the nitty gritty and the kind of conflict that goes on in real life, that ideal isn't so easy to put into real practice, okay? I think here of the classic Peanuts comic strip where Lucy announces, I love humanity. It's people I can't stand, okay? <laughs> And so, yeah, there are some barriers. So I wanted to talk just very briefly about what maybe some of the barriers are to this idea of universally conferring value on our fellow human beings. What some of the barriers are, and, and then maybe what some aids are that, that have been fairly recently developed that will help us just chip away a little bit and make it a little bit easier to reach out to all those other people. So we can start with uh, one of the ramifications of evolution. And that's that we human beings are very tribal beings, right? We identify with various groups and uh, even make our identities in terms of those groups. And you can see how way back in the history of evolution that would have had survival value. Right? And of course, that's all natural selection really cares about is survival value and getting the genes on to the next generation. So of course, in a very simple prehistoric environment, if I'm in a really small group, uh, I know everybody and I can help other people and they can help me and we can look out for each other and protect one another. So the tribal thing, to, to evolve the tribal thing into us, that made perfect sense. But sometimes in our contemporary world, it's not quite so helpful, right? It's just not quite so helpful. I mean, even back then, it, it had its problems, right? So if I were living back in prehistoric times, uh, I might one day be happily using a rock to grind corn into meal for my tribe, and the next day just as happily picking up a rock and bashing in the head of somebody from another tribe. And apparently that happened 
all too often. You can look at a terrific book by Steven Pinker called The Better Angels of Our Nature, where he amasses a lot of even archaeological evidence. You dig up those prehistoric folks, and a lot of them died from blunt force trauma. So he's pretty sure that we're better off walking down the street today than we would have been walking through uh, whatever the high grass back then in prehistoric times. So even back then, it could create some problems. But, but in our day and age, tribalism, not such a good thing. I mean, certainly nation state tribalism, you know, where we threaten to throw nuclear weapons at each other. But I think that in America, what first comes to my mind, and I assume comes to a lot of people's minds, is just this age-old problem that we seem never to have been able to solve in America, despite our republic being several hundred years old now. And of course, what I'm thinking about is the perennial issue of race in America and racism, right? That's tribalism, right? You're this race, I'm this race, I identify with my race, or even more vitriolically, I hate you because you're a member of another race. That's maybe one of the ways in which that tribalism that, that had its moments from a survival point of view uh, has really gone wrong. Well, that's the bad news, of course. I said I, I wanted to touch on just a few little discoveries in recent years that I, I hope can kind of chip away a little bit at these uh, barriers to our conferring universal human value. And the one is that scientists have told us in recent years that race is not a scientific category. It's a cultural construct. And I believe that my colleague here, Professor Butler Sweet, will elaborate on this and do it with much more expertise than I can muster. But in my brief little version of it, we're not divided into different races. We're all part of the same race, the human race, right? We, we're all members of the species Homo sapiens. There are no different races. Again, race is a cultural construct. And I think that, if I understand this correctly, I've, I've seen this kind of on a very individual, concrete way. Um, for instance, I have a nephew, um, one of whose parents is white, and the other parent is black. Now, which race is he? Well, again, I guess there's no such thing really as race, but you know how that was decided? Kind of sadly, by society. They looked at the color of his skin. He didn't get to decide. See, he was too young before people had already started to say, well, here's the color of your skin. You're obviously a black man, right? Which is fine, except that, again, you'd, you'd think that there would be some kind of scientific basis. But obviously, he's half white and half black. There is no scientific basis to the idea of him being a member of one race rather than another, right? The other thing I wanted to just mention, which I've found very fascinating since I uh, came across it a year or so ago. And I think, again, just gives us a little optimism, allows us maybe to just chip away a little bit at the, uh, the barriers to conferring value upon all human beings, is that there's a group of scientists. There are, there are also scientists who disagree with this. But there's a fair group uh, and who have adduced pretty solid evidence that every human being alive on the face of the earth today is descended from one woman who lived maybe roughly 160,000 years ago. Okay, so we're talking about modern Homo sapiens. You know, if you try to trace our heritage back, you go to hominids, and they can go way, 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 way back. But Homo sapiens been around. You know, we've been around for maybe 150,000 to 200,000 years. So what you do is you say, okay, um, look at any one of your cells, and you know, a little drawing of a cell. And there's the nucleus in the middle. But there's this little, these little guys running around in there called mitochondria. And the mitochondria happen to have 
Well, they're, they're the energy producers of the cell, really. But they happen to have a little dollop of DNA in them. Not the whole DNA that you have in the nucleus of your cells, but a bit. And it turns out that this mitochondrial DNA is passed down mother to mother, not through the men, not through the male line, but matrilineally. And so scientists can figure out, especially working with like, well, how quickly does, see, because now you don't get any of the DNA changes that you get when you're mixing male and female DNA and ordinary reproduction and all that, but you can just ordinary mutations. So they can think back and, and figure back until they see a kind of convergence in the past, and they say, oh, well, here's a, a particular mother from which we all derived, and they call her mitochondrial Eve, okay? Now, some scientists weren't really happy about that choice of terms because to call her mitochondrial Eve might lead to the misunderstanding like she was the first woman or something. That's not at all the case. But she, uh, she's the progenitor of all of us. So now we can say, gee, we're not only not divided into other races, uh, different races, but we're all relatives <laughs> in a pretty direct sense. Um, I have to admit, it bothers me a little bit that this means that I'm actually related to my in-laws, but that's a pretty small story for a, another time. Okay. So um, notice again there how this really should free us up in a way to say, yeah, uh, I can confer value on you, you can confer value on me, and I can confer value on people far beyond this room who otherwise, when I see their pictures and stuff, I might say, well, they don't look quite enough like me, or they don't seem quite enough like me. Then there's a, you know, a smaller consideration as I wind down here. Apart from really devastating problems like racism. There's just the fact, and, and maybe this is a kind of weaker, a kind of weaker inheritance from our tribalism. There's a human tendency to be parochial. Uh, in other words, to kind of be comfortable in a certain rut, right? And uh, never get too far outside, maybe the little group of friends we have, the little rut we have. Uh, and so if we can fight against that parochialism, you know, you've heard the expression, you should get out more. Well, it seems to me that intellectually speaking, and probably culturally speaking, we should all get out more. And I do have, uh, I think, a couple of pictures here to uh, indicate, here we have parochialism, I believe. Uh, now, I admit, this is a stereotype of parochialism, right? I'm, I'm probably not being entirely fair here. So I, I do have another slide after this. But this looks like a pretty parochial world, right? Like they need to get out more, right? And what I'd really like you to focus on, which I don't think is going to be too tough, is the woman. She doesn't look very happy, right? Now. This is a painting by the artist Grant Wood. Uh, the title is American Gothic, I guess because the house behind it is a kind of Gothic architecture. You can see the window there. Um, it's said to be the most parodied painting in history. Uh, beats even the Mona Lisa in terms of all the variations that have been worked on it, humorous, humorous variations. You can imagine the guy, instead of holding a pitchfork, he holds everything imaginable. But here's a little bit of interesting art trivia, I think. We all, almost all, see this as a farmer. He's got a pitchfork, after all. A farmer and his wife, right? But the artist, Grant Wood, actually meant it to be a farmer and his daughter. Now, that might be even sadder for this woman, right? I'm assuming that especially every woman in the audience can completely understand why she has that very sad look on her face. It just doesn't seem like in this environment, that she is ever going to, to use Aristotle's term, flourish. Ain't going to happen, right? But I admit, I admit, that's a kind of stereotype, 
you know, that that, that world is particularly parochial. Oh, what about this? Upscale cocktail party. Uh, taken someplace, you know, taking place somewhere maybe like on the Upper East Side. Seems like the opposite of American Gothic. But on the other hand, look a little bit more carefully. All these people look awfully alike one another, first of all. This is not a picture of diversity, certainly, right? Kind of dress alike, they're all a bunch of white people. And I have a feeling that their conversation isn't diverse either. Like these two guys right here, I think they're talking about hedge funds, <laughs> uh, most likely. And that probably goes all the way back, you know, to, to, the, to the back of the party. So again, we should all just intellectually see if we can't just get out a little bit more. Well, you know, the problems are real in being able to say, yes, we can confer value on all of our other human beings. Um, as an aside, I might say, someone, just because someone might be thinking, well, wouldn't the real solution here be to say, what about a divine creator who confers value on all his people? But for the purposes of this talk, we're going to stay tethered to the earthly sphere. So I'm saying that's a good question, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bypass it here. However difficult it is for us to maybe rise above Lucy's, I love humanity. It's people I can't stand. There were people even in the ancient world who got it who got this idea of people are valuable because we say they are, and people are valuable universally because we can confer value on all people. I'm thinking of the ancient Roman playwright Terence. Terence said, I am a human being. Nothing human is foreign to me. Thanks for listening. Language, Literacy, and Communication. Title of the talk, I'm not a number, am I? Professor of Psychology here at Sacred Heart, Stephen Briner. All right, thanks everybody. So my name's Stephen Briner. I am a professor of psychology here at Sacred Heart. And as somebody in the social sciences, part of what I do is spend a lot of time thinking about how we take abstract ideas like love and aggression and irony and turn them into something that we can count and measure. So today, I'm going to be telling you about how we use the social sciences to come up with one way to measure the value of life. And I'm going to tell you about four insights that we get from those measures of value of life that give us some hope about the direction that we're going as a species. But before I do that, I'm going to ask you to bear with me while I tell you about two of my obsessions, human frailty and unexpected disaster. <laughs> so let's think back to this past summer when the entire world seemed glued to this news story about a group of Thai boys and their coach who became trapped in a cave that was flooded over the summer. So it seems like as an entire community, we watched and worried and fretted about these boys and their coach. We wondered whether or not they were going to be rescued before they ran out of air or food. Collectively, we grieved at the news of the death of one of the rescuers, Saman Kunan, and we worried that more lives might have been lost until the time that they were successfully rescued. Now, the one thing that we probably didn't worry about was the financial cost. Now, I've had a hard time finding estimates, but let's say, hypothetically, that the Thai government spent $10 million rescuing these boys and their coach. $10 million divided by 13 
gives us a cost of about $770,000 per life saved. Now, was it worth it? I think most of us would probably say yes without hesitation. But what if the cost had been 10 times that? What if it had cost $7.7 .7 million to save each life? Well, I think most of us still would have said yes. But you would start see, seeing some people start to question that, right? And that's even before we get into the cost of human life. And all of this is talking about something that happened on the news. But how much are we willing to spend to save a life when the crisis is less in the public eye? This is the question that William Watson, an economist, asked when he looked at another crisis that was happening at the exact same time of the Thai cave rescue. You see, during that same time in Quebec, Canada, there was a devastating heat wave, and it killed nearly 70 people. Most of the people who died were over the age of 55 and lacked air conditioning. That means in the future, deaths like that could be prevented if, say, Quebec levied a special tax to ensure that every person over the age of 55 would receive an air conditioner to help offset the effects of that heat wave. But would people really shoulder a cost like that? Well, I got curious, so I did some quick back-of-the-envelope calculations, and let's say that the cost of that tax would come out to something like $200 for every person in Quebec above the age of 55. That would come out to a price tag of about $340 million. And when you look at everything, assuming that next year it would save another 70 lives, that's a price tag of about $5 million per life. Would the people of Quebec gladly shoulder a burden like that? That's the questions we're going to be talking about today. How do you put a value on life? Well, up until a few decades ago, the way that people put a value on life was through something called lost wages. Right, so let's say you have a miner who dies in a cave-in. What's the value of his life? Again, until fairly recently, people would have said the value of his life would have been the amount of money he could have earned in wages had he survived. Now even today, a lot of companies still view the cost of life through a similar lens, through a cost and benefit of something like, well, let's say they have a defective part. They might ask themselves, what would be the cost of recalling this uh, uh, defective part compared to the cost of the lawsuits that we might incur from people who died or were injured as a result of this defect? But neither of those two things really gets us at what you or I mean when we talk about the value of life. Well, starting in the 1980s, an economist named Kip Viscusi came up with a measure that he called the value of statistical life. And this can be thought of maybe more accurately as the value of death rather than the value of life. So to put it very simply, the value of the statistical life is the amount of money a community would be willing to spend to reduce the rate of statistical death by one person. I'll give you an example. Let's think about the amount of money that a community might be willing to spend for improvements on the fire department if those improvements are going to reduce the death rate by 1 in 10,000. Let's say we're talking about a town of 10,000 people. So if they're able to make these improvements, statistically speaking, one person will not die. One life will be saved. So how much would each individual be willing to spend to save this one life. Let's say every person of voting age in this town is willing to spend $400. Well, 400 times 10,000, that would give us a VSL, a value of statistical life, of about $4 million. Collectively, this community is willing to spend $4 million to save the life of one person. Now, when I say that, that might seem like a cold way to think about these mathematics, right? None of us want to put a dollar value on life, but we do it all the time. Think about the risks that we incur on a day-to-day -day basis 
just to make a little bit more money. Think about if you commute to work, the chances that you might die in a car accident compared to the amount of money you're willing to make for that commute. Think about the amount of money that a steel worker makes to offset the danger of that job compared to, say, something like working in an office. So when we look at these estimates, again, it doesn't seem like maybe the most comfortable way to value life, but it gets results. Take a look at the way that different federal government agencies value statistical life. Now, if they can show that one of their policies is going to save a certain number of lives at a cost per life that's under their VSL, that policy has a better chance of getting pushed through, right? If you can show there's going to be a lot of bang for your financial buck, that means there's more chance that the government and the powers that be will push through your policies. Now, when I take a look through these trends in the VSL, what do we see? Well, first of all, let's think about the way that they're measured. Usually what happens is we bring people into a laboratory, we ask them, how much would you be willing to spend to offset a particular risk? And we calculate the VSL from there. And when we do that, we see a number of surprising insights. Let's look at the first one. We value life now more than ever. And this is hardly a no-brainer, right? Life is cheap, and the more people we have on Earth, the cheaper life gets. Or at least, that's what some of us think, right? When I was born in 1980, there were a little over 4 billion people on the globe. Now, that number is approaching 8 billion. So in a world teeming with humanity, shouldn't life be cheaper now more than ever? That's what you might think. But when you look at the value of a statistical life, the story we see is the exact opposite. If anything, even when you adjust for inflation, the value of life has been getting higher and higher and higher. And again, that's when you adjust for inflation. So what does this tell us? It means that as time has gone on, we've become more and more willing to spend a greater proportion of our wealth to prevent a statistical death. And think about the way this is measured. It's not that I'm spending more money to save my own life. It's that I'm willing to spend more money to save a statistical life of somebody within the community, even if that is just a faceless, anonymous statistic. And that brings us to our second point. We value anonymous statistical lives about as much as the lives of somebody we know or somebody that we've seen in the media. Let's think back to the heat wave in Quebec. So if the cost per life saved was something like five million, well, VSL studies would assume that that cost would go through, that a tax would be passed because the amount of money we're spending per life saved is under the VSL. But you might think to yourselves, well, it's one thing to talk about something like the Thai cave rescue, right, where everything is in the media and we have a national attention on it. But are we willing to spend as much money on an anonymous life, on some faceless statistic? You might well think that, eh, well, if you talk about a person I know, that's one thing. But if you're talking about some abstract idea, well, that's another thing entirely, right? Well. To answer this question, we can look back to another rescue that happened a few years ago. If you remember the 33 miners in Chile who were trapped and the amount of time and effort and wealth that was spent to rescue them. Now, Dr. Louise Russell at the University of Pennsylvania argues that once you take everything into account, the amount of money we spent to rescue each of those miners is comparable to what the VSL says we should have spent. And if anything, we actually spent a little bit less per minor than what we would have expected from the VSL. So what this tells us is that it seems like we don't make a distinction between a person we know and a person we don't when it comes to how much money we're willing to spend to save that life. Now again, 
Keep in mind that what we're talking about is a value of statistical life that is taken from hypothetical studies, right? Asking people how much they might spend rather than looking at how much they would spend. And so that might start raising questions in your mind. And that brings us to our third point. We value life more than we think we do. It might be easy to take a look at something that's been in the media, like the Boy Scout, uh, the, the soccer team in, in Thailand, or the miners in Chile, and say, yes, of course we're going to spend a lot of money on that. We're seeing it in the news every day. And it might be easy to think about, well, if you look at a hypothetical situation, how likely is it that people are really going to behave the way that they would in a hypothetical situation, right? Maybe there's a problem with just asking people how much money they would hypothetically spend to offset a hypothetical risk. That gets to an idea that we in psychology call cognitive bias. You see, we like to think of ourselves as rational individuals who see the world as it is. But in reality, we take a lot of mental shortcuts. We use a lot of cognitive biases that save on mental processing power at the expense of accuracy. We overestimate the, some risks, and we underestimate other risks. For example, we overestimate the likelihood that we'll die in a plane crash. Because the idea of a plane crash is so striking and so shocking. And we underestimate the likelihood that we'll die of a heart attack, even though that's one of the leading causes of death in the United States. And people tend to be pretty poor predictors of what we would actually do in a real situation. So if I give you a hypothetical situation, you might say that you would spend a certain amount of money. But would you really do that in a real situation when it's your money or your own life on the line? Well, there's another way that we could measure the value of statistical life through something that economists call hedonic wage. The idea here is that if you're working a job that's more dangerous, well, then you should be making an amount of money that helps compensate for that, right? That helps offset the risk that you will die on the job. Now, the logic here is that the more dangerous your job, the more money you should make. But the relationship between risk and reward is not that straightforward. Let's think about three of the most dangerous jobs, pilots, steel workers, and truckers. Now, sure, pilots make more than the median wage to offset the danger of their job. But look at steel workers. Yeah, they make a little bit more than the medium wage to offset the risk, but not that much more. And when you look at truckers, they're taking on a significant risk. And yet, overall, their, wa their wage is lower than the median income. So that means that if we're going to figure out this relationship between risk and pay, we have to take a closer look. That's where big data comes in handy. So we can use things like uh, databases of worker fatalities to take a look at the danger of a specific job rather than a career. So yeah, on average, steel workers might make less than you would think. But some of those steel jobs are going to be more dangerous than others. So shouldn't an employer be willing to pay more money to offset that risk if the steel workers are in a more dangerous gig than normal? Well, this is how it would look like if we did that. So let's say that this is a more dangerous steel job than normal. So it's got a death rate of 1 in 3,000. Let's also say that we have 3,000 workers. So statistically, one of these steel workers is going to die on the job. Let's also say that each worker needs an extra 3,000 in compensation to help offset this risk. Well, 3,000 times 3,000, that would put the VSL at 9 million. So how does this stack up compared to what we hypothetically say we would, we would be willing to pay to offset the risk of death? You might think that when you look at the real data, that the VSL would be lower than what it is in a hypothetical situation. But in reality, it's quite comparable. If anything, we seem to put a value on our lives that's a little bit higher when you look at what people really do compared to what they might hypothetically do. 
This is surprising because people are normally very bad predictors of what they would do in a hypothetical situation. But in this case, when it comes to how much we value life, it seems like our words line up with our actions, not something that happens a lot in the human race. Now, I've saved the last point for last because I think for some of you, this point is going to be obvious, and for others, it might be very surprising. And that is, the older we get, the more we value life. So we are living in a culture that is obsessed with youth. It's something that I'm reminded of every time I look in the mirror and try to convince myself, well, it's not really a patch of gray hair growing in. It's just the sun making my hair look more blonde than it normally does, right? So when we value youth, it might be that we put a greater value on the life of a young person than on an older person. And at the same time, it might be that as we get older, we get more self-interested, right? We get more selfish and cynical. Some of you may have heard some variation on this adage before. It goes something like, if you're not an idealist by the time you're 20, you have no heart. But if you're an idealist by the time you're 40, then you have no head. Is that really what we're like? Are we really just doomed to become more self-interested and more curmudgeonly as time goes by? Well, when you take a look at the VSLs, it might surprise you. Who's got a higher VSL? People who are 18 or people who are 62? With our obsession with youth, you might think it's the 18-year-old. But when you look at the data, it's really the people who are 62 that have a higher VSL. Now, part of this is because when you're in your 60s, you probably have more money than you had when you're 18, right? And there's a cynical take on this. You might look at the data and think, well, this is just a person with more money willing to shell out more money to, for the sake of preserving their own life. But let's remember what VSL measures. VSL doesn't tell you whether or not you're going to be able to save your own life. It tells you whether you're going to be able to save any person's life within your group. So what this tells us is the older we get, the more insight we have about the preciousness of life, and the more of our resources we will dedicate to preserving life, even if that life isn't our own. So if we take all this together, if you're still skeptical about the value of a statistical life, well, I can't blame you. You know, even if this is a policy that gets results, none of us want to be reduced to a faceless, anonymous financial statistic. And yet, the lives that are saved through these programs are not hypothetical. They're not theoretical. They're real people being saved. And it might be my life. It might be your life that's being saved. So when I take a look at the value of statistical life, when I take a look at what these trends are telling us, well, you could ask whether or not it's a good value. But what I see when we, look, when we look at what we value in a human life is that our values are good, whether or not we're getting a good value. Thanks. Uh, next, some thoughts about uh, sociology of the family, race, and ethnicity, then racial identity, uh, in a talk titled The Myth That Fuels White Anxiety. Please welcome a professor of sociology here at Sacred Heart University, Colleen Butler-Sweet. So we've all heard the projections that by 2050, 2044, 2040 even, a mere 22 years from now, white people will be the minority in America. And if you believe these projections, not only is a white minority imminent, it appears to be happening at an accelerated pace. Factors like an aging white population, a decline in white birth rates, coupled with the fact that the majority of recent immigrants to the United States have been from Latin American and Asian non-white countries, 
all of these factors serve as the basis for these predictions that we will soon be a majority minority country. Now, these massive demographic changes, as Laura Ingram recently described them, have served as part of a growing sense of anxiety for a portion of white America. This white anxiety, sometimes referred to as white extinction anxiety or white displacement anxiety, hinge on this fear that some whites have that they're being erased from American culture. And this fear of erasure has led pundits like Pat Buchanan to declare that white America is an endangered species, which certainly sounds scary, if you're white at least. And it's not only a fear about being erased and replaced that propels white anxiety. There's an additional layer of concern that with numerical minority status will come social and political subordinate status. The idea that as whites lose their numerical advantage, so too will they lose their power over social and political institutions. I would even argue there's a more subtle but deeper dread that racial minority groups might take their new fine majority status to exact revenge. So all of these feelings of fear, anger, dread have come to define what we understand as white anxiety. And those are some pretty powerful emotions. So powerful, in fact, that we find it was racial anxiety, not economic anxiety, that propelled Donald Trump to the presidency in 2016. In fact, exit polling and other evidence suggest that working class whites who prioritized economic concerns, like unemployment and wage stagnation, they broke in favor of Hillary Clinton by a significant margin. It was whites who were most concerned about cultural change that served as the bulwark of support for Donald Trump. And it really shouldn't come as a surprise that white anxiety found a home in the Trump campaign when the candidate himself repeatedly and unapologetically defended whiteness from any threat, foreign or domestic, but especially from black and brown immigrants. So what we saw in 2016 is white anxiety fueled by this prediction of a white minority had real social and political consequences. But here's the rub. The predictions of a white minority by the middle of the century are a myth, or at the very least, based on a myth. Or what Dr. Andrew Pierce, philosopher at St. Mary College, calls the myth of the white minority. Now, what Dr. Pierce argues here is that the definition of whiteness used in those demographic projections is so narrowly, so strictly defined that it artificially deflates the size of the white population. And his argument is based on a broader premise that racial categories, including whiteness, is not fixed, static, and unchanging, but just the opposite. Racial categories in America are subjective. They're fluid. They do change across time and across culture because race itself and racial categories are socially constructed. Now, I want to take a moment here to briefly explain how something like race, that's physical, right? It's your skin color. It's your hair texture. It's your facial features. How could these physical attributes be socially constructed? Well, some might assume they're biologically anchored. The problem with that is scientists have tried since the 17th century to prove that racial categories have biologically distinct evidence to support them. What they found, though, 
time and again, despite efforts at using blood composition or phenotypical traits to prove that race is biological, what they found time and time again is that humans operate in a genetically open system, which means there's no single gene or cluster of genes that are exclusive to any one particular racial group. So what then of the, but it's physical, how can that not be biology argument? Well, the thing is, no one's denying that there is a range of phenotypical features that people can have. That there is a range of physical appearances across humanity. But which of those physical features you use to define a racial group is subjective. Where you draw the lines around a racial category is subjective. Take, for example, gosh, what am I doing here? There we go. Take, for example, this image of these adorable little girls who represent a range of phenotypical features. If you had to, where would you draw the lines around race? Would you, for example, take these three little girls here as your definition of whiteness? Well, what then does that mean for this little girl who's now excluded from our definition of whiteness? Or what if you used these three little girls on the end for your definition of who qualifies as black? Well, the little girl in the middle here might fit that criteria based on her skin color, other physical features suggest she wouldn't be categorized as black. Or for this little girl right here, she doesn't meet the criteria in terms of skin tone, but by other physical features might be defined as black. The point here being these racial categories are messy. We decide where to draw the lines around what traits qualify one as a member of a particular racial group. Now, Add to that the fact that racial categories in America are based on both phenotypical traits and the intersection of race and ethnicity. Now, if we understand race to be socially constructed categories based on observable physical features, ethnicity we can understand as socially constructed categories based on cultural attributes, language, food, music, recreational patterns, and shared ancestry. So ethnicity isn't visible in the same way that race is visible. But we've used the combination of the two to define racial categories historically in America, including whiteness. Now it is true that the boundaries between white and non-white in America have been the most strict. At one point in time, having just one drop of non-white, non-European blood was enough to exclude you from white categorization regardless of your physical appearance. But it is also true that our definition of whiteness has expanded at different points in our history. Usually when the dominant white group determines it's necessary to preserve its power. Take, for example, the turn of the century. At that time, whiteness was very strictly defined based on phenotypical features like fair skin and the requirement of tracing Anglo-Saxon ancestry. So that meant during the great wave of immigration, where we did see a significant influx of immigrants from Southern and Eastern European countries, from Italy, from Greece, from Germany, from Poland, all of those incoming European immigrants did not fit the criteria of whiteness because none of them traced Anglo-Saxon heritage. For the Ital Italians in particular, not only did they not have Anglo-Saxon ancestry, their complexion was darker than the original English settlers. So they were excluded from whiteness on two counts. This is particularly important given the fact that at that time, Italians grew in population size from 300,000 to 2 million over the course of just 40 years. 
Now, it was at that time of mass immigration that the white majority realized they weren't going to be a majority much longer unless they expanded the definition of whiteness to include the new incoming white immigrants from Europe. And this expansion of whiteness has become so comfortable and familiar to us that it would almost seem bizarre to have like a non-Italian white category, right? Italians are just white. Fast forward to today, where once again, we have a very narrow definition of whiteness that's used in these demographic projections. Specifically, to be counted as white in those projections, you must have phenotypical features that are associated with whiteness, and you cannot trace Hispanic heritage. Non-Hispanic white. That is the definition of whiteness that is used in the predictions that whites will be a minority by the middle of the century. Now, when talking about Hispanics, Hispanic is an ethnic category in the same way that Italian is an ethnic category. The big difference, though, between Hispanics and Italians is the fact that there is a wide range of racial variation within the Hispanic category. Everyone from David Ortiz to Andy Garcia are Hispanic ethnically, but based on their phenotypical features, David Ortiz would be categorized as black, and Andy Garcia would be categorized as white. In fact, Andy Garcia was first made famous playing an Italian-American in The Godfather. And it's the Andy Garcias of the Hispanic population who are white phenotypically, but Hispanic ethnically, that represent, according to the 2010 census, 53% of Hispanics. 53% of the Hispanics are white in terms of phenotypical features, but ethnic in terms of their, uh, Hispanic in terms of their ethnic categorization. Now, that means they would not be counted in the statistics indicating that whites will soon be the minority. That includes people like, if I have any Red Sox fans in the room, you know who this is. This is the late, great Red Sox left fielder, Ted Williams. Ted Williams was Hispanic. He traced Hispanic ancestry through his mother, who was Mexican-American. That means, based on the definition of whiteness used in these demographic projections, Ted Williams was not white. Ted Williams' children are not white. Ted Williams' grandchildren are not white. Or the actress Alexis Bledel. She was made famous for playing Rory and the Gilmore Girls. Alexis Bledel traces Hispanic ancestry through her father, who's Argentinian. As a result, based on the definition of whiteness used in demographic projections, Alexis Bledel is not white. Now, what I find interesting is in these cases, not only is there nothing phenotypically to indicate that Ted Williams or Alexis Bledel aren't white, even their surnames aren't really a tip off that they trace Hispanic ancestry. What's fascinating, though, is even when someone's surname is a dead giveaway of their Hispanic ancestry, we tend to overlook that because we prioritize the phenotypical features, like in the case of Ted Cruz, whose given name is Rafael Edward Cruz, son of a Cuban-American. Ted Cruz is Hispanic as Cruz indicates. Yet my students are usually shocked to find that out. Because they just assume that Ted Cruz is a white guy. Or even more so, Cameron Diaz. Diaz. Daughter of Emilio Diaz. Cameron Diaz is Hispanic. She traces Hispanic ancestry. Yet, most Americans will look at her and just see a blonde-haired, blue-eyed white woman. Now, based on these demographic predictions that whites are about to be the minority, 
Cameron Diaz, Ted Cruz, Alexis Bledel, and Ted Williams are not white. But if you include folks like Ted Williams in your definition of whiteness, the white population isn't shrinking, it's growing. We are not facing an imminent white minority, we're facing another white expansion. And that's to say nothing of non-white Hispanic Americans who over time through marriage and having children and grandchildren who will likely be defined as white too. Right? So this notion that a white minority is happening is based on a false premise. So if it's based on a false premise, why does it persist? Or more specifically, who benefits? from this prediction that whites are about to be the minority. Well, let's start with people of color in America. Let's start with immigrant groups in America. Do they benefit from the projection that they're about to be the majority? Well, if policies like the Muslim ban and zero tolerance at the border, both of which were fueled by white anxiety and this fear of a white minority are any indication, no. Immigrants are not benefiting from the projection they're about to be a majority. If anything, those projections are used as justification for open hostility towards people of color in America. Those projections are used as justification to challenge any sort of legislation designed to help racial minority groups who face real material oppression. So if they don't benefit from these demographic projections, who does? I would argue that these projections that whites are about to be a minority allow white Americans who continue to maintain a stronghold over positions of power and prestige in this country, it allows them to occupy an oppressed status an oppressed status that they can mobilize around in order to challenge the source of their oppression. The projections that whites are about to be a numerical minority has allowed them to engage in identity politics in a way they haven't been able to in the past. Moreover, Dr. Pierce would argue, or has argued, that the way we've come to understand white anxiety overlaps in a troubling way with traditional white supremacist narratives, particularly an emphasis on white solidarity and the defense of white power. White anxiety has been part and parcel of mainstreaming white supremacist rhetoric. What's happened is white anxiety fueled by this projection of a white minority has been politically weaponized. And what I hope I've been able to demonstrate to you today is that weapon is based on a myth. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll be uh, hearing from Annie Wendell, who is the Assistant Director for the Office of Volunteer Programs and Service Learning here at the Sacred Heart. Uh, she has a passion about global citizenship, social justice, and student development. The title of her talk, The Danger of the Selfie, Human Digni Dignity in the Age of Social Media. In 2013, the Oxford Dictionary recognized selfie as the new word of the year. Now, for those of you who might not be familiar with this millennial-generated term, let's take a look at the definition. A selfie is a photo that one takes of oneself, typically with a smartphone or a webcam, and shares via social media. 
Now, some might argue that we are catering to the millennials, and full disclaimer, I happen to be one, <laughs> by feeding into their self-proclaimed narcissism and, um, and self-promotion. However, I'm not here to give millennials a bad rap because the idea of the selfie isn't exactly new. <laughs> Commissioned self-portraits have been around for quite some time. No, what I'm here to talk about today is that second piece, the shared via social media. And I do this because I, along with 8 million Instagram users and nearly 2 and a quarter billion Facebook users, utilize social media on a pretty regular basis. As an avid traveler and a community development professional, I like to share my story with family, friends, professional networks, as do most of my peers. However, those likes feel really good, right? <laughs> but we need to be mindful of the what and the how we share on social media. I say this because when I was, a, it was also 2013, and I accompanied a group of students to Tijuana, Mexico on an alternative spring break. We spent months in advance planning for and fundraising for a local organization that built low-income housing for their community members. We were excited for this main construction project and were even more excited about the itinerary item that would place us at an orphanage at a local uh, town. And after days of mixing and pouring concrete and tying rebar, we were really excited about that promise of playtime with the kids. We loaded into the van and drove across town and were greeted by 20 really excited kids that rushed the van, excited to greet their, their new visitors. We spent the next hour and a half talking, laughing, playing games, and taking lots and lots of selfies. We ended the evening with a song and dance performance, hugs goodbye, and we were back on that bus. In the weeks and the months that followed that trip, we shared our story with family and friends and anyone who would listen. And we shared those photos that we took during that experience, including the photos of that brief hour and a half interaction with the kids. They were soon plastered all over social media and the comments started rolling in, oh my gosh, you're doing wonderful work, you're saving the world, and wow, you're giving up your traditional spring break college experience. And that felt really good. Except that one little piece of that hop off, to snap some photos and hop back on, just didn't sit right. What was the purpose behind those photos? Were we out to capture that feel-good moment of interacting with the kids? Were we self-proclaiming, this is what I sacrificed in terms of time and energy? We all know that cliche, a picture is worth a thousand words. But in this instance, our photos were only telling one side of the story. We were sharing with our audience that this brief encounter was changing the lives of the, of the kids we were working with. And the research shows that really it has little to no impact, or quite frankly, could have a negative impact on the community. Since my time back, I've looked at the research and I've realized that those one-time, short-term, vulnerable situations that we are interacting with, uh, with marginalized members of our community actually could perpetuate cycles of dependence, cycles of, um, of Western aid, and actually put these children and other marginalized members at, um, at cycles for abuse. And all of this was simply ignored with a post to social media. Now I'm not here to discourage local or, no, or global volunteerism, and I'm not here to dissuade you from telling your story on social media. I am, however, in an age of instant communication, asking you to look at the story you are telling. Those ad campaigns, those um, profile pictures that we are capitalizing on marginalized members of our society, we need to take a closer look at. We become the authors, the creators of the content that we put out and share to the world, whether it's through video, photo, captions, or even hashtags. There's real negative consequences for misrepresenting the marginalized members of our community. And I ask you to take a look at being able to um, promote the dignity of all members of our community, those that are marginalized, 
and those that don't have a voice. And so I'd like to share a few things to consider before you post that selfie. The first being gain informed consent. Gaining consent is that first step in the practice of responsibly portraying others on social media. Ask for permission before you take that photo and post that selfie. I and you would not be able to walk down the street in the United States with a camera and walk into a local public school, hospital, or social service agency and expect to take photos of the students, patients, and clients. We used informed consent and that practice should extend to others locally and globally. Avoid taking photos of people in, mar in vulnerable or degrading positions. And this includes hospitals and healthcare facilities, as it does not accurately represent the lives of those members. It also includes minors. Ask permission for the, from the parents and the caretakers and the guardians of these youth. When we rolled up to the orphanage in, in Tijuana, Mexico, we assumed that these children wanted their photo taken. Who's to say in 20, 25 years, when they see their portrayal of themselves across social media, that they would choose to portray themselves that way? In all media, promote dignity. It's not hard to forget about this step when you step off into a new environment, whether it's a culturally different location within your own country or halfway across the world. Because it's so easy to make sweeping yet false generalizations of an entire culture, of an entire people, of an entire nation. We've all seen some version of this uh, photo of the starving African child as dubbed by the media. Now when the media portrays only poverty and hunger, again, it is only telling one side of the story. The media capitalizing on the suffering of our marginalized members of society is exploiting their bodies to promote and extract uh, feelings of pity. And it's also fueling that dependence on Western aid in that it tells the story that only the Western savior can come and fix this situation, fueling the deep-rooted but false perception of Western superiority over the global South. And this narrative is problematic because others assume that a simple donation from the West can fix the problem, which oversimplifies a complicated solution, uh, situation and depicts marginalized members as helpless victims. Putting and promoting these photos online recognizes the marginalized members not as unique individuals within the context of their own family and their own community, but rather as a prop or as an extra only in relation to the Western viewer. So in the way that we capture and promote videos and photos and other sorts of media, we need to make sure that we are not further demoralizing or reinforcing negative stereotypes, and instead recognizing the human worth of every human being. We need to make sure that we ask the question, how would I like to be portrayed if this was me? And recognize that human beings are not tourist attractions. We should also question our attentions as they play a really large role in how we choose to portray others. Why are you traveling and volunteering abroad? Is it for yourselves? Is it for your social media account? Is it to see how many likes your post can generate? Is it to create a new and exotic you that you can promote via social media as to the places that you were visiting? Researchers have coined the term tourist gaze to explain the way that tourists and other volunteers that are traveling globally may interact, see, and essentially consume the world around them. The landscape, the cultures, and the people inherently become a subject and are objectified by this tourist gaze. The tourist gaze, by its very nature, makes the viewer and the, and the subject separate and distant rather than seeing the overarching interconnectedness of social, political, and economic forces at work. When my fellow students and I stepped off that bus, we essentially acted with this tourist gaze in that we were starring and uh, performing in our own photos, right? We were at the center of these selfies with the children gathered around us. 
and unintentionally we're creating barriers between us and our community members by being on the, the one side of the camera lens. In this position, we were not only um, building these barriers, but also um, perpetuating the stereotype that we were the stars in a story of suffering. And that brings me to my final point. Use your position to bring down those stereotypes. When you travel and volunteer abroad, you have two options when you return home. You can tell the stereotypical story to family and friends, confirming their assumptions about a particular culture or people. Or you can challenge those stereotypes by offering nuanced details about the complexities of a culture and reverting that one-sided story about pity and poverty. As I mentioned before, I'm not here to discourage anyone from using social media because in fact it can be used as a tool, as a, social catal as a catalyst for social change when used appropriately. This can be done by simply asking local experts to tell their story. What would they like to share to the larger world? And using our own social media platforms to give voice to that story. If we're here today to think about what we're worth, we need to make sure that we are considering the human dignity of every human being, those that are marginalized and without a voice, and work to enhance the connectedness and the solidarity with those folks. There is a large um, negative result for misrepresenting um, marginalized community members, and it perpetuates this power, power imbalances, as well as negative stereotypes, and will also oversimplify the story of a complex situation. So I invite you all, and I encourage and I challenge you, to challenge one another to see the whole story, tell the, tell the whole story, see the whole picture, and portray others on social media, not as helpless victims, but as empowered individuals. Thank you. Annie Wendell, thank you. Next, we'd uh, like to share a, a video from 2010. It's from actually Ted Women 2010, and it features Cheryl Sandberg, who um, talks about why she thinks we have too few women leaders. And uh, finally, here this afternoon, some insights about fighting for equality of opportunity for all people. Professor. Uh, Stephen Brown is Professor Emeritus of, of Management at Sacred Heart, also the former director of the Nonprofit Center at Sacred Heart, and former dean of the Jack Welch College of Business. And his talk here this afternoon, Brand You, Developing Purpose for Success in Business and in Life. Professor Brown. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, thank you in particular for hanging out here. I know it's been a kind of long afternoon, and I appreciate it. Uh, so I got interested in uh, looking at this idea of purpose and purpose in life. By the way, I'm the guy who, at 4 o'clock, will say, I'm going to tell you about have finding meaning in life in 20 minutes. So uh, you know, have a little bit of uh, chutzpah, I'd say. OK, so uh, I started looking into purpose. And I actually thought, wow, it's a good idea. I finally had a good idea on my own. And I went and started looking at uh, the literature, and as all academics do, that's the place we find truth. And uh, I then started looking at uh, the web. Uh, that's the place where we find somebody else's truth. And uh, I was overwhelmed, literally overwhelmed, at how much people had been thinking, writing, and uh, posting about purpose. Like, literally overwhelmed. To the point that I started thinking, wow, I guess, why is it so popular at this time? And I found a few things that I think explain it. By the way, this is how important, how uh, popular it is. There's even a thing called the meaning movement. I go, wow, it's a movement. I'm like behind here with the movement, but it's a movement. 
And uh, so I looked at what, why would this interest, where would it come from and be so popular? So the first thing I thought about was I can have a good meal cooked by someone else, watch a first-run movie, keep in touch with my friends, and never leave my living room. In fact, be in my living room with just me and my two puppies, right? And I'm be in touch with everything I want. And what that means, it's all good, I, don't, I can shop at home, I can be there, is increasing isolation. So more and more we're isolated, and it's really about us and our little uh, environment. Then I started thinking about, so where have we found meaning before? And I realized that what there really is is a lack of vehicles for people to actually have expression of meaning or of defining their purpose. My dad, depression baby, uh, great guy, great family man, wonderful person. But throughout his whole life, there was one thing that he was just so proud of. It was really his purpose. By the way, it wasn't me. <laughs> uh, it was that, in fact, he had fought in World War II. Okay? He was part of a national purpose to defeat evil. Think about that. How big an idea is this? Work to defeat evil. And him, a working class guy, could be part of that purpose. So we, at that time, had a national purpose. And then uh, myself, a baby boomer, as some of you in the audience are, we always found purpose or meaning in our work. You know, we actually lived to work, unlike some of the younger generations that actually are smart enough to work just to live. Uh, and w it was a matter of, t of uh, practice. Go to a cocktail party, told people two things. My name is Steve Brown. I'm a professor. And from that, they knew all about me. They knew my socioeconomic status, my educational attainment, my, uh, probably my politics, or at least they thought they did. And they would construct all they needed to know about me, at least to make it through the party without embarrassing themselves or myself. Um, and so we had that. We've now moved away from almost any vehicle for people to find their purpose. To the point, and it really, and then I thought about it, it's not that unusual in today's society. Health care, health insurance, retirement, almost everything about our person, individual, we have now shifted from responsibility from an organization like a big company to individually having to manage that ourselves. And we've done that with purpose as well. Now it's your job to find your purpose. I also think that the idea that there is such pervasive greed, uh, exploitation, uh, and, and sell, in some ways, in some quarters, celebration of that, that in fact people are, saying, are thinking about there must be more to this. Okay? There must be more to this. And they're looking at what that is. In fact, uh, as my younger, uh, youngest grandson has taught me, even in Moana, right, he, as, as he, he, Moana's grandmother stopped her and says, I'm going to answer the question you've been asking all your life. What was I meant to be? Right? So even in Moana, we have purpose. Uh, and that's, in some ways, the theme of, the, of that uh, particularly well-done Disney movie, by the way. Uh, I know because with my grandson, I've seen it at least 15,000 times. <laughs> um, so isolation, lack of vehicles, uh, and a natural wanting to somehow uh, contribute to, to our world have led to us to really be exploring uh, what purpose is. And I might add that even though it was a great idea, every management guru ever has now written a book on leading with purpose. So I, I will tell you that my next book, that will not be the title because I'm not going to be leading with purpose 12 edition or something like that. So I'm going to figure out some, some other way of saying it. So um, what is purpose? And here are a few definitions of it. But I want to say that first, that the term has been used in different ways in different communities. Uh, so one way that it's been used is just meaning. And I've said that, finding some meaning in your life. And of course, this was made particularly uh, 
famous in, uh, by the work of Viktor Frankl, who found meaning and found finding meaning even helped him to survive the unspeakable horror of being in concentration camps. Uh, it's also, and, and through his work when he uh, got free, he actually helped other people find meaning so that they could work on some other level of self-adjustment. So it's used, for example, we use the term meaning in uh, communities uh, of uh, people who are, uh, have been um, addicted, have addiction. And uh, meaning, once we find meaning, we're able to work and live and, and succeed without uh, the addiction or the thing we're addicted to. So, and also for younger people, and we use it here on campus, there, it has a meaning of just finding the right career. What is the right job? What is your purpose? I don't know, being an accountant. Well, let me just tell you, the way I'm using the term, being just being an accountant isn't purpose, it's a career. Uh, purpose uh, has some characteristics that are quite important, which we'll talk about. But first, I, I want to just quickly, I'm not even going to read all of these, but uh, the first one, purpose is an essential element of you. It is the reason you are on the planet at a particular time in history. Your very existence is wrapped up in the thing you are to fulfill. And it goes on. And this is a very, by the way, one of the best definitions. It's from uh, Chadwick Boseman. Uh, yes, I did confer with the Black Panther to get this right. Uh, and uh, this is what he, and he, by the way, is pushing people for purpose. So if it's the Black Panther is, I think we all should be as well. Uh, Nick Craig, who's written a, a great book on leading with purpose, the 12th one, uh, actually at first in his book talks about all it is is what is uniquely you. And I thought, wow, that's kind of a selfish definition. There's no external, there's no impact in the community, et cetera. And in fact, it kind of trivializes the concept of purpose. Uh, however, later on, he does talk about leadership and pur uh, leadership purposes, who you are and what makes you distinctive, to the in interpart, but also, uh, if you look down further, it is what you've driven to achieve, the magic that makes you tick. And he talks about it in terms of both not only being a leader, but being leaderful. And what leaderful means is that even though you don't have the authority in the position, you still stand out as a leader. Okay? And you still stand out as someone who is, gives the leadership in getting something very important done whether or not you have that uh, a leadership position. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some other characteristics of, uh, of purpose. So first of all, as I, I've indicated, it's not, it is what's uniquely you in terms of bringing your passion, your uh, skills and interests uh, together, and your, uniquely what you have to offer. But it's important that you do this for a bigger impact in our society. It's not about, so your, your purpose couldn't be, make, as many of our undergraduates do currently have, you know, becoming a billionaire by the time I'm 36. And they, this number is always randomly picked, and it's never an a, a even num, a round number. Um, that's about them. Purpose is, the, is about the impact you intend to have towards social good. Uh, and so that's one of the characteristics. Uh, the second characteristic is, and, and this is not in the literature, uh, is that it is developmentally related. So if you think about developmental theory, psychology, psychological theory, there's a couple of things about it that relates to purpose. The first one is that almost all developmental theories, we go from thinking about ourselves and getting our needs fill, fulfilled to moving to the place where you, in fact, are concerned with social uh, society and the planet and others, and you, you behave in such a way that takes into account others besides yourself. And most of the developmental theories attempt to answer two basic questions. Who am I? And what is my place in, in the nature of things? Okay? It's right out of philosophical anthropology. It's the two things we all try and answer. And if you look at uh, these questions, what that lead it is what really leads you toward purpose. Uh, the other way it's related to developmental theory is, in fact, you have to have enough experiences to get outside of your own interest and wants in order to have a purpose that has a, a social impact. 
Uh, that probably means there's a certain age at which it's easier to have purpose than not, okay? And it, that's been uh, pretty well proven. Uh, LinkedIn did a, a global study recently on purpose, like everybody is. And what he, they found was, in fact, that when self-identifies, are you living with purpose or living without purpose, as you go up in age, the percentage of people that, that actually identify themselves as living with purpose increased. So millennials, about 30% said, yes, I'm living with purpose. And it, all the way up to baby boomers, uh, those of you who are baby boomers, I don't mean to make it sound like that because you're there, it's the end. But in fact, uh, it, it is um, about 48%, or nearly half of baby boomers identify themselves as living with purpose. Um, so, what is that, before living with purpose, how do you find your purpose, okay? Uh, there are a number of ways that this happens. Quite often, uh, you, you, and when I say, by the way, it's developmentally uh, uh, related, it doesn't mean you can't have purpose earlier. And we always hear about these uh, people, uh, young 12-year-olds who make hats for people who have lost their hair because they're being treated with cancer and work hard to make them more comfortable. Uh, you about uh, classmates who are selling things in order to uh, raise money for a classmate who has, in fact, had some kind of illness and, and they're trying to work with it. Uh, and those, we, have, we don't have any longitudinal studies of whether these people be, keep that purpose or don't, uh, so we don't really know what impact that has on, on purpose long term, but we do know that they, in fact, are engaged in activities that are like that. What, um, but where does it come from? Oftentimes, though, it does come from a, a, an experience, both positive and negative. Okay? So you might have uh, enjoyed something so much, it might have meant so much to your life, that in fact you uh, think you want to share that with others. Many professors, this is why they get in the, in, into the occupation, you know, being enlightened and learning and being uh, uh, involved with uh, the idea, uh, world of ideas has been so important to them that they want to share this with others. At least that's what they say. Um, and it, it is true for many of us. And then there are people who become, uh, get, find their purpose in a negative event. Uh, and an example of that would be uh, parents from the... Uh, uh, the, um, the tragedy in Sandy Hook, that they have been so negatively impacted by that experience that many of them become gun advocates, right? The uh, gun control advocates that, in fact, I want to save other people from this level of pain, and that becomes their purpose. Um, there are many exercises and things you can do to start thinking about your purpose. Uh, I'm not going to list them all now because I said that literally if you do a Google search, you're going to find 30,000 of them. Uh, by the way, the first time I did this talk, I did a Google search on purpose. And it was a month after Justin Bieber released his most recent CD called Purpose. Uh, and believe me, I had to get through 10 pages of Justin Bieber in order to find something that was what I was interested in. Um, but I, will, I do want to talk about one I've been through to sort of give an example. Because one of the other characteristics of purpose is it takes time. It's not like you go in, I want a purpose, and the next day you, you, know, you sleep on it, you get, wake up and you say, oh, I know what my life meaning is, and I know what I want to do. In fact, quite often I run into people and I'll, they'll say, what are you doing? I'll say, oh, I'm doing a little research. I'm going to write a book on purpose. And they'll say, another one? No, only kidding. They'll say, wow, I want to get one of those. And my new answer, by the way, is when they say it that way, because it doesn't happen overnight, is I looked it up. Amazon does not sell one. Because people are looking for purpose, but as with everything else in our society, quick and cheap. Um, but one I've been through. Uh, about uh, two years ago, I wrote a first-person article. Now, what a first-person article is, is the subjects of that study are the authors. And I did it with three of my colleagues. So we had a writing group of four people. And for almost a year, we worked on who we were and what that had meant. And we were really looking at the pre-retirement, retirement, retirement occupation, occupational behaviors. Most of these people, had, uh, two of these people had already retired. And they were, they were putting together what they called a portfolio um, job, which meant they were doing lots of little things. 
uh, no, be, no full-time commitment to anybody. And we did a bunch of stuff. We wrote a, a, a abbreviated biography. We sh shared them. We coded them, like all good behavioral scientists do. Uh, we then talked about them, as all good professors do. We then, uh, once we did that, we then uh, rewrote them, wrote what was explaining some things that were important. And we, it really gave us some in, insight into our ups and downs and what really was important to us through our life, sort of beginning that process of looking back on your career and what is it you contributed. Uh, we even, by the way, this was a fun one, uh, did our career without words. We did a visual in, uh, interpretation of our career. So one person drew it. I used all these emojis from online to sort of show what I had done. And we, we spent about a year doing this. And at the end, I think we were at, at the point where we knew what we wanted to do in terms of our next occupational stage, but we also knew what our purpose was because we knew what was important to us. Uh, that took a long time, and so I'm not saying that, but I am saying for particularly the younger people in the audience, the place to start to find your purpose is to have enough experiences that you know what it is that ignites your passion. So, so living with purpose is a little different than living without it. Uh, one is that I think you are in your dedication to something and having an impact. You, in fact, are, um, have passion. You have commitment and you live this life of commitment. Through that, you get some um, level of voice. You find your voice around this topic. And, and quite honestly, the, this uh, paradigm that is in the giving voice to values, which is one of the ways we teach ethics on campus, uh, it, we, you find you go from being committed to being sure this is the right thing for the world to, to finding your voice and eventually finding the courage to speak up about it in any situation about the, what is right. And, and it really is, give, it, it's an empowering thing. It's, getting, it's a courageous thing. It's about getting courage to do the right thing. Um, now, I said there are 1,200 books about uh, leading with uh, passion of leading with uh, purpose. And I thought we would talk about each one of them today. So, uh, the f and what they basically say is this. When you have a purpose and you're a leader, you have, you come across to your followers as A, having authenticity, you, something real about you, and something about your fact that you have a commitment that makes you more inviting to at least explore for your followers. Um, and it, from now, remember you're you, you're courageous, you're authentic, and through this, it's pretty easy to to say these are the things we want to get done, and these are the things that are worth acting on. That is, you begin to know, have some clarity about what's important, and having that clarity gives you power to act. So you're also a leader who can act. And what we have found in research about leadership is that uh, through particularly the Globe study is those things that are authenticity, uh, courage, ability to act, uh, a concern beyond what uh, just yourself. That's a key element in leadership. The question always is, are you in it for yourself or are you in it for all of us? And when, once the followers find that, it's, you've got some trust. Those characteristics are the characteristics that we found across cultures are what followers want from leaders. So, uh, in fact, it is a way, you know, finding purpose is a way of honing your skills to be a great leader. Uh, as, as you can think, as you think about great leaders uh, that you've admired, many of them do have a sense of purpose that is a little bit beyond a normal, per normal leader. Well, last but least, I do want to talk about having a business that you run with purpose. And these are three businesses. I purposely picked ones that weren't extremely widely known and were very large companies. Uh, and Unilever, I'm going to start with them. Unilever is, is the largest, uh, and sometimes Procter & Gamble, as they go back and forth, uh, seller of consumer goods. And so chances are everybody in this room has used a Unilever product in the last week. Hopefully, it's Dove. <laughs> Dove is one of them. And if you weren't using the Dove, you might have been, you know, they, that whole series. They own Ben and Jerry's. Uh, they own uh, Talenti's. 
Uh, they own many food products and, and household products. And it is one of the three big companies for consumer products with Procter & Gamble and Nestle's. Uh, they have a new CEO. Uh, from, he's a uh, Dutch. And when he came in, he made a commitment uh, because of uh, his uh, purpose to help save the earth, uh, the planet, uh, that he would cut his uh, gas house gases, his negative gases uh, that his company produced by 50% in three years. It's pretty amb ambitious. Uh, and he did do it, okay? Uh, and uh, he really, uh, and he's now building factories that have zero impact on the environment. Uh, Shibanti, uh, you know, uh, Shibanti Greek yogurt was started by an, an immigrant. Uh, the immigrant, in fact, um, has hired immigrants, given them uh, opportunities to in enjoy the fruits of, you know, the opportunities of the United States of America, and also uh, to give them other support. And I just want to, Salesforce, a very large technical uh, uh, technology company, it's a business to business, so they do businesses for, with big business. Uh, they, their CEO, I'm going to have to make this short, but uh, did some, heard about gender differences in pay, that was just talked about by Sharon Sandberg, and uh, said it couldn't be in my company. Did a study, and yes, it was in his company, because as we know, it's in all companies. And he made a commitment to eradicate that. And in two years, uh, he had some equity by gender in the company. This is a big company. This wasn't like an overnight thing. Had to get the board of trust, uh, board of uh, governors to agree to it, you know, et cetera. And as you can see uh, down here, this is right off their website. They've made equity a real key issue and underpinning of what they do. Uh, equal rights, equal pay, equal education, equal opportunity for all of their employees. Now, I just want to do one more thing about what, you know, the, the uh, purpose and its uh, impact on business. First of all, the argument about whether it's purpose or profit has now been killed by a, a mountain of research. Companies with purpose do better financially than those who are not. Okay, and in that in global study I mentioned that LinkedIn did. Let me tell you the, the, just some of the results of that. Uh, of the companies that said they didn't have purpose, that they were about just about business, um, about 47% of them in that one year showed a decline in their profits. Okay, at the same year, 85% of companies that identified that they did lead with purpose, in fact, uh, had a um, increase and they uh, both had some growth and increase in their profit. Uh, of those 85% that had growth, 58% uh, of them had, over the last three years, obtained 10% uh, growth. Okay? Uh, so it was really, you know, there's, it's not like you have to give up on the finances in order to lead with purpose. Uh, what else do you get when you lead with purpose? Uh, committed employees. Uh, which helps you in terms of the uh, labor market of recruiting and retaining talent, which for a place like Salesforce is quite important. Uh, you get committed customers, and all stakeholders become committed to who you are. Uh, 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 you have a community that's more welcoming to have you in their community. Uh, and um, you have, uh, I think, overall a long-term a business that has a reason for existing, has a way of attracting customers, and by the way, just as an offshoot, you also get free advertising. Two of the three of these companies have had 60-minute syrup pieces, et cetera. Um, so I, I just want to summarize that, uh, you know, living with um, purpose individually helps you with your optimal functioning. You're happier, healthier. Even research shows you even live longer if you live with purpose. Uh, and uh, there's places you can find your purpose if you work at it. Uh, it is good for your leadership style, your company, uh, and of course, you're going to make the world better. We all feel good when we do something good, and having purpose is actually very, very good for you. So go out and enjoy it. Thanks. Thanks to uh, all the speakers uh, here today. Thanks to uh, Brian and Michael for pulling this all together. And uh, very soon.
GSH website, there will be um, a recording of this that you can take a look at. Uh, and thank you all for coming here today.